מחבלים! Clearly the operation is, uh, is tactically successful. Israel uh, was able to, to hit Hezbollah hard uh, starting a few weeks ago and up until now. Uh, so the operation is seen as successful by most Israelis and by me and by the military command, which isn't, doesn't mean that, that the, the operation is about to end. It doesn't mean that Hezbollah is, uh, is on its knees. Uh, you know, when the IDF said we hit 250 targets, my next question will be out of how many? So, you know, the... the the numbers are impressive and clearly the IDF is doing something in Lebanon and is uh, gradually destroying uh, a lot of the infrastructure that was built in Lebanon for the last uh, uh, two decades. But uh, we don't yet see a situation in which the IDF can, can withdraw back to Israel or, uh, or, or a situation in which Hezbollah says, okay, you win, we'll lose. We give up on the fight and, you know, go our, our separate way. It's important in two ways. First, it's important because a, a, a military or a semi-military organization, uh, um, you know, needs its commanders. Without commanders, without field commanders, without communication devices, if, if we go back to the, to the beepers, um, w without all these things, it is much more difficult for such organization to function, to hit back, to uh, reorganize itself against the uh, the uh, attack of the IDF. So on the operational level, that's surely important. It's also important in the in the more symbolic sense of of morale and the ability to project uh, the image of power. When you see that Hezbollah lost its leaders and cannot really find someone to fill in the shoes of Nasrallah and the other uh, senior commanders that were gone, because everybody knows that the next uh, commander-in-chief will immediately become a target for Israel. That says something about, uh, about Hezbollah's ability to, uh, you know, to recover and go back to its to its former self so the more israel continues to as, as you described it to chip uh, and and make sure that the, the the level of commanders that is coming in is a lower level less experienced type of people and that they constantly have to be on the run and and hide uh, that that's good again on the on the on the uh, image level of projecting power and on a tactical level. Well, we, we, we know that Hezbollah is a well-trained organization and we should assume that uh, some of their fighters uh, are, go are going to put up a fight and, and, and make it more difficult for the IDF uh, to get in. Th there are three things that must be considered when, when, we, when we think about the, the current state of the fighting. One is the fog of war. We don't exactly know what's going on inside Lebanon. I don't think the IDF would like us to know the exact details of everything that, that's going on. So, you know, uh, uh, it's clear to everybody that uh, Hezbollah is an abled fighting force. Like they can put up a fight, uh, but what exactly they do now and uh, how difficult the fight is for the IDF we, we don't have the exact details on that. Second point, we don't know what the instructions are for Hezbollah fighters. Uh, did they get the order to stand up and, and, and put up a fight? Or maybe they got the order to withdraw, to hide, to lower the profile in order for Hezbollah to survive this round in which the IDF seems to have the advantage Maybe all they want is to, you know, to, to keep, to preserve what they can preserve and wait for another day. Uh, that's a possibility that we must consider. And that's why I think the current stage of the fight isn't going to, um, we, we aren't going to see an end to it very soon because the IDF will need to pursue 
um, uh, Hezbollah fighters, and we'll need to make sure that Hezbollah didn't just move to a different place and is reorganizing itself for, for the next day. Uh, the, the third point that we need to take into account is that uh, the IDF now is fighting with few restrictions. It has the backing of the, of the people. It has the backing of the government. And it is, you know, apparently it is well prepared for this fight. We know that for the IDF, for many years, Hezbollah was the main target of preparation. Some people even say that, that the fact that Israel weren't prepared enough for the attack in the south from Hamas is because every resource was, was pointed towards, towards Hezbollah in the north. So, you know, in some way, it is encouraging to, to see that even though we heard time and again that Hezbollah is an able fighting force, that they have a lot of, you know, infrastructure and material and resources with which to hit back, when the IDF puts in its mind to something and is well prepared for a mission, it can, it can deliver. And right now, it seems as if the IDF can deliver at least on this front. It's problematic both for the UN and for Israel. For, for the UN, it's problematic because it's, it's quite clear and we now have the evidence to show, uh, to show for, for that UNIFIL uh, was in many ways a useless force. Uh, it was placed there to, um, to help with implementation of a UN Security Council resolution uh, the resolution declared that Hezbollah, fighters of Hezbollah will not be able to be near the Israeli border, will not be able to build infrastructure that is aimed at uh, the possibility of attacking Israel. And, and you see the entrances of tunnels of Hezbollah just, you know, meters or tens of meters away from uh, UNIFIL forces. So obviously, UNIFIL is not a force that Israel can count on to keep the peace. It's not a force that the international community can count on if it is serious about removing Hezbollah from the border. And let me remind our viewers, Hezbollah is defined as a terror organization, but by most civilized countries in the world. So, so UNIFIL is, is not helpful. Uh, the fact that the UN insists on UNIFIL forces remaining in their place is just, it's an unnecessary complication. It's, it seems as if someone is trying to be disruptive uh, with the effort to uproot Hezbollah and, and uh, remove it away from, from the... Lebanese-Israeli borders. Someone is trying to sabotage or complicate the Israeli operation for for no good reason. I mean, you know, I I can even you know even if I would like to be the the you know I'll try to defend the decision to keep Unifel there. I have no good excuse for it. I don't see any good reason for this other than disrupting. Uh, the Israeli operation. Fighting in urban areas is always tricky. Fighting when there are many refugees and civilians mixed with terrorists, mixed with operators. That, that, that's a, it's a complicated situation for every military. It's a complicated situation in the, for the IDF. Uh, the IDF is sincere and serious uh, concerning its attempts to avoid civilian casualties. But when you fight a war for, for over a year now, um, and and in in such um, mixed areas, um, bad things happen. Uh, I, I you know I'm not trying to defend misbehavior. Certainly not misbehavior of soldiers. If there is one, uh, there are errors, and there always will be errors by commanders or or advisors or or anyone else. Um, and and there will be casualties in such war uh, more than necessary. The, the remedy for it is, is quite simple. If Hamas were to um, 
renounce the fight and and decides to surrender, the fighting will be over and all civilians will be safe. Uh, Israel cannot agree to a situation in which Hamas can hide behind civilians and then say, well, you know, civilians are getting killed in the fighting, so you must stop the fighting. The, the, the situation in which Israel finds itself in the last year is, um, is such that most Israelis see as an existential fight for Israel's survival. When you fight for your own survival, you must take into account the fact that you need to guard as much as possible civilian lives, but you cannot just quit the fight because of the risks to civilians on the side of the enemy. Israel declared publicly that it's going to attack Iran in some way, it declared that the attack will be significant, but the definition of significance is, is quite tricky. We don't know what Israel is about to do. I think that the Israeli government will have to make a statement here. I think the public expects it. I think within the coalition, people expect it. I think the Iranians expect it to, to some extent. Israel cannot just say, okay, you hit us with uh, 200 missiles and we are going to sit idly by and do nothing. So every, everyone expects a, a dramatic response. Now, will this be dramatic in the sense that it will ignite a second, third, and fourth round of of counterattacks, that's one option. The other option is for Israel to try and walk a very fine line um, and get, get something that on the one hand is serious enough to project power and to have to restore some measure of deterrence. And on the other hand, for Iran to be able to say, okay, we can contain such response without without having to 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 uh, push back and and respond yet again i think that the international community has a big role here the more the more dramatic the more severe the threat on iran from countries well mostly from the united states if the iranians understand that israel and the united states are well coordinated that the israeli response was measured in the eyes of the Americans and that the Americans will not see uh, an, Iranian, an Iranian retaliation favorably and might decide to get involved, then, then this would be the last round. But again, you know, when Israel responds, I think all bets are off. Uh, it depends on the, on the targets, it depends on the level of success, it depends on, on public opinion in Iran and the Arab world. It depends on so many factors that to you know sit in my office and say, well, this or that we will be the result of, of an Israeli. Israel is going to take some risk in responding to Iran. Uh, I think it will probably be a calculated risk, but it will be a risk nonetheless and what's going to happen after Israel attacks is, you know, is your guess is, is good, as good as mine.